Amen. Let's give a hand for our band there. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if you noticed uh, the subscript on the bottom there, written by Tim and Aubrey Greenwood. So if you like that song, make sure you talk to Tim later. Uh, we got to do a, a big road trip, Tim and I, about a month back. It was epic. <laughs> yes, it was. Well, thanks for having me again, church. Um, before we get started, I do want to, I failed to give a thanks last week during the last sermon. Um, I talked about when I had went to college, it was a very rough experience for me because I went from growing up in Mayberry, everybody was kind of a believer, there's a very common culture, then I went to a very uh, <clears throat> school that was prided itself on engineering and intellectualism, and I got mocked pretty heavily, and so I had taken my Christianity to and shell. What I failed to talk about was the goodness of God during that, because during that time, I was blessed with a sponsor family. You see, at, the, at Annapolis, they have what's called a sponsor family. So, <clears throat> you know, all these midshipmen come from all around the country, and these families willingly of their own, you know, just being good people, volunteers, they say, hey, I will take in that college kid for a year because your first couple of years at a service academy, you can't wear civilian clothes, you get very little free time, you can't have a car, and, you know, when you're 19 and 20, this is pretty devastating. And so they covenant or they commit to come and pick you up at Annapolis every weekend. They take you to their home and they feed you, which if any of you have ever fed a 19-year-old like me, you, you know how, <laughs> how much of a commitment that is. Um, but so many sponsor families at that time were just like these local, they would sponsor like eight kids and it was just like a party atmosphere. And, you know, I'm intensely introverted. You know, if it wasn't for my wife and kids, like, you'd probably see me once uh, a week in Athol somewhere. Like, my wife and kids drive me out of my introversion. Um, but I was blessed with a sponsor family that was also believers. And they lived out in the country, George and Kathy King. And they're such family to me. And, and it frustrated me that I failed to mention that because two, two reasons. One, God always takes care of you. You know, he, he gave me a family that was just what I needed during that time to get me through that period. And then two, just because George and Kathy King, who still watch my sermons, they're just such wonderful people. I want to give them a shout out. And they are still like family to this day to me. So I try not to get too much when I think about them. All right. So last week, maybe? Maybe not. So last week we talked about uh, the problem-solving equation, right? The right tool for the right job with the right operator. Last week we focused just on the right tool and the right job which as a pastor, I feel that we all need to get on the apologetic strain. In some way, shape, or form, you as a believer are going to have to defend the faith, be it with your family, uh, be it with someone you're actively witnessing to on a grander stage, etc. But in today's environment that is openly hostile to Christianity, if you're going to witness and proclaim his truth, you're going to have to defend it. They live in a symbiotic relationship. And it's not always a hostile relationship, right? Sometimes people just don't understand, and they want you to explain how you can believe that this world hasn't been around for a billion years. You know, it's, a, it's an honest question for many people. So it's definitely something we need. I'm not going to talk more about apologetics. If you're interested, like I said, November 16th, please come and check it out. A lot of you have signed up. I'm excited to go forward with that. But today I want to focus on the right operator. Now, those of you that know me know I'm not really skilled with tools, per se. <laughs> uh, I can still remember the first time Kerry came over and he introduced me to an impact drill or something like that. You know, the one that's like, gah, 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 gah. you might know what I'm talking about. And, like, I was amazed because he could take that thing and every time just like, and I would take it and would strip it out every time. Like, I don't understand the concept that I'm missing in this thing because supposedly it's supposed to prevent you from doing that very thing. So as I thought about today and ended the sermon series, you know, the difficulty in a pastor, and you learn this, and, and where my grace for pastors, I, I'm very non-critical pastors now that I preach because I understand how difficult it is to, to bring a sermon that's going to reach people who have been in the faith for 30 years and new people. And so I was really wanting to figure out how can I inspire all of you to understand that 
God has called us all to be part of the body of Christ. There's not a single person that doesn't have some job, some mission within his kingdom. Every one of us have that. So trying to think of a way I can inspire us to do that while remaining true to the word. You know, I was reading again through 1 Samuel 17, and I was struck by imagining that part where David has just faced Saul. He's just given his speech, and he is literally, I mean, really think about this. You're a young man in a shepherd's tunic. I assume they wore something like that. You've just refused this armor, and you're going to face somebody. He, I can't imagine he didn't think he might die. Now, obviously, the word doesn't tell us that, but anybody who's faced death and done dangerous things, you know that it's likely that I might just die. You know, I was blessed with being able to fly aircraft carriers, Jim as well, uh, and land on carriers. And I can remember very vividly a few times going out on the deck at night, sitting on that pitching deck, waiting to get into an aircraft and just being like, God, I might die tonight. (laughs) I can remember during those moments that I would really, my sensations were so incredible because I'm just like, I want to feel wind for the last time. Like, I want to, like, just sense life. It, it was so incredible in those moments when you, you're going out to do something that you know is dangerous. And I can't imagine that David, when he stood in that stream, that the water, he just couldn't feel every ripple of the water, that he just couldn't hear every noise. And as he sat there and selected five stones, that just had been such a powerful moment for him as he waited to face likely death. Thumb drive? Okay. Make sure I give you the right one. Yep, there you go. That's this quick. So as I was thinking about that in 1740, it talked about the five stones. So I went back through it, and I've kind of extracted five traits that David exemplified during this passage that we can all and should all exhibit if we want to become the right operator. So we'll start there. If you see on your notes, we'll start with the first one there, simmer with zeal. Simmer with zeal. <clears throat> now, I chose the word simmer because too many times uh, we get on fire and we burn out, right? Now, that's a metaphor, and burning out is so common because we go into something, get so excited, and, it, and we don't take do stuff at a pace, I think things are so much more doable, things are so much more um, achievable when we do it at a nice, slow simmer. Because life is a marathon, right? If you don't think life is a marathon, have some kids. (laughs) (coughs) And then you'll realize really quick. Uh, Now, the word zeal, I think this is often misunderstood to be an emotion and to be that's driven by feelings, but that's not actually what zeal means. Zeal is a passionate pursuit, an active interest. If you remember from my last sermon when we talked about greatest treasure, which is our vertical relationship to God and our horizontal relationship to mankind, in both those relationships, our head had to lead. You know, Christ is the head of church. He leads the proper family. The man is the head of the household. He leads that family. You in your life, your head always must lead. People that allow their feelings and their hearts to lead, they end up in bad situations. They just don't end up in the right context or doctrine in most cases. When your head leads, your heart goes with you. You don't leave it behind. That's also a grave error. To be completely rational with no emotion is also, and that's where I struggle, and that's where is the great thing about church, is you force me to be an emotional person. Because if, again... If I was by myself, it's, you know, I would never have any emotion whatsoever. I'd just be happy out in the woods doing whatever I want to do. But you deal with people and you realize, wow, I got to have some emotion. I got to have sympathy. I got to have compassion. I got to have selflessness, sacrifice. It's this beautiful plethora of emotional life out there that you can only really have with other people, right? It's easy to be happy by yourself. At least I believe so. Now, so how do we simmer with zeal? You set your mind on Christ, not on the distractions of the world. 
I don't want to anchor here, but I just want to point out that we are all accountable to God for our lives, our time, our talent, and our treasures. It is not me to say how Lucas should live his life. Lucas has his own family. He has his own walk. He has his own mission. It is not my job to judge Lucas. It's my job to come along and be a brother to Lucas. But Lucas will give account for Lucas's life, and we all are individuals in this way. And I say that because there's the difference between a distraction and something that's recreation and something that's an infatuation can be individual, right? There's nothing inherently wrong with football or fishing or shopping or whatever wholesome activity there is. But if that begins to consume you so much that that's all you do or it keeps you from coming to church, it keeps you from being part of the body of Christ, then in my opinion, you have delved into the realm of distraction, vice or recreation. You see, God could have created the world instantly, right? He chose six days and the seventh day is the Sabbath, not to force us into this box where we can only worship on the Sabbath day. He did it to illustrate for us that our lives have got to have some level of recreation or we will burn out. And what is a distraction, a recreation, or infatuation in your life? You've got to figure that out based on your prayer life, based on you living in the Word. You know, um, I think one thing that drives my wife crazy is I'm kind of a black or white guy. I'm either all in and like uber disciplined and only eating lettuce, and then I'm like off the rails eating M&Ms and every kind of cereal known to man and, and not working out. And like, I, it's like, bah, 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 bah. Right? So I got to find balance in my own life. And I think that's the thing. We, we've got to find that appropriate level of occupation. Because, right, Adam was created in the garden to do what? What was Adam doing in the garden? He worked. Occupation is a natural, healthy part of life. And if our society is telling everybody to do what? Just live a life of recreation. And that's why the society is so off kilter. Because people aren't having an occupation. Your occupation and recreation need to be balanced. Oh, am I poor seal? Oh, almost stripped. Sorry. Thank you, Shane. So here in 1 Samuel 17, now, I encourage you to read this passage later. Um, I'm going to kind of cherry pick, so to speak, some passages to make my points. Here in 1 Samuel 17, 25 through 26, so the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, which could be a good or bad thing, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, what shall be done for a man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, there's two things I want to point about David's uh, resistance to distraction. It's a resistance against an external distraction and an internal. Notice the difference in focus between the army and David. The army's focus is on what? The enemy and the reward. Where David's focus is on God. Now, obviously, he mentioned those when he replies, but his main focus is on the fact that who is defying the army of the living God? And when he calls him an uncircumcised Philistine, he's not using a slur. He's not using that in the sense of like, um, you know, this. It, it's not a slur. What he's trying to, it's a backhanded um, comment to his own army. Because what does circumcision signify? that we are in a covenant relationship with the most holy God, the creator of everything, who's chosen us as his nation. He's promised prosperity, protection, providence. So David's saying, who is this man who has no covenant with the one and only God Almighty mocking us, those that are in a covenant with protection? Do you see what he's saying? He's the only one that's grasping this. And that is, I truly believe, why he's the one willing to step up. Because he sees, because of his zeal, his passionate pursuit for God, he sees the nature of the problem. It's not about this ginormous man there. 
It's about somebody who's defying God who's promised them protection. Now, the other thing that I thought was amazing in this is uh, those of you with young kids, like anybody remember the Family Circle, Bill Keen, that comic strip, right? I mean, some people don't even know, remember what comic strip is, but I used to love comic strips when they come out on Sunday, right? Because Sunday had what? The colored comic strips. It was the coolest thing. Um, you know, they had the picture, was it Billy? I think Billy was a young kid. He'd do something. He had the little dash lines. He'd go, like, all over the place, right? Like, so that's my young son. Like, if you tell my young son, like, hey, can you go feed the chickens? Like, literally 15 minutes later, I will find him in the pine trees with a pine cone grenades, like, attacking our cat. Like, I'm like, how did you, like, I literally just, you had to go straight out the door to feed a chicken, and you're, like, on the other backside of the property having war with a cat. I mean, think about this. David, as a shepherd, could have found an infinite amount of distractions between himself and the battlefield. And even after the battle, could have found something to distract him. But he never lost focus on the fact that there was a person defying his God. I mean, that, that part is just amazing to me. And I think the reason David was so able to keep from being distracted is he was so motivated by compassion. Now, we need to be motivated by compassion. Now, when I use the term compassion, I don't mean it in the sense of uh, just a pity, like I feel pity for it. I mean compassion in a deep sense that motivates action. Now, in 1 Corinthians 13, I, I didn't put this up here, so I'm going to read this for you. You know, Pastor Chris has made this comment a couple times, which I, I always chuckle at, but... Um, 1 Corinthians 13, right? That's the great wedding verse, right? The wedding chapter, so to speak. Um, the outside world thinks of 1 Corinthians 13 is like you get married. The preacher reads 1 Corinthians 13. He drops the mic and you're married. Boom. There it is. Um, it amazes me, though, if they read this and they don't read the first three verses. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And I, I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. I mean, do you understand how terrifying that is? That's saying that everything we've done in life, when it's not motivated by genuine love, literally means nothing. I mean, that, that, this chapter terrifies me. And food for thought, we won't go over it, but God is love. So a lot of times when people do good stuff but they don't have God, is, can it really be love? Because God is love. So that's something to think on. That's a little nugget for you to work on uh, with your own Bible study. Now, so how are we motivated by compassion? We keep our hearts strong. We do, do not allow dilution from others. I think the best example of that is going to be in this next passage we read here in uh, verses 28 through 29. Starting there in uh, 28. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the man, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Again, sometimes the context of what has just occurred can be lost on us because we didn't live during this time. The oldest brother during this time is not just your, your sibling rivalry. Your oldest brother in a family like this, is the next in line to take your father's place. He's the double inheritance. He is the one who's taken the mantle of your family name and forward. So to have your brother call you out like this in public, it had to have stung. And all younger brothers look up to their older brother. Even if they're fighting you, even if they do it, and we have some disagreements here, but... Am, and I, I get beat up by my, my older brother a lot, and I still love him to death. I still looked up to him. So this was particularly stinging. And 
unfortunately, a lot of time, the worst, the biggest discouragement we get is from those closest to us. You know, I, I recall um, when Leslie was pregnant, which, side note, I don't, is it, I don't know if you say when Leslie was pregnant or when we were pregnant, because if I say it was when Leslie was pregnant, then I sound like I don't want to be part of it, and I say, I'm pregnant, and I'm like, like I'm trying to, I had nothing, I, I mean, I had something to do with it, <laughs> but don't get me wrong, but I didn't have anything to do with, like, the baby and the birthing and stuff. Anyway. So when we, when we were pregnant, yeah, we, I'm definitely not politically correct, we had, uh, we decided to do natural childbirth because a close friend of mine who's probably also watching the sermon had, had gotten me into that, the Bradley Method, husband coach childbirth. Um, it was supposed to be a very um, emotional, involved the father, it was just supposed to be a different kind of way of doing it, and we bought into it, and it is what we had planned to do. And then, of course, the Marine Corps ended up <laughs> deploying me <laughs> five months after we got pregnant. And as I was deployed, the one thing that blew my mind was when I would talk with Leslie, and she just, the amount of people that would come to her, and she'd say, yeah, I plan to have, you know, do natural childbirth. And people are like, oh, man, I knew this lady who tried natural childbirth, and her umbilical cord got around the baby. They got rushed to the hospital. It was like everybody felt the need to tell her, like, the worst thing that happened. It's like if you're a motorcycle rider, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm a motorcycle rider, and I guarantee if I meet somebody who's not a motorcycle rider, what are they going to tell me about within the first sentence? I, I know somebody who, who's dead or maimed. I'm like, I, okay, like I don't understand why you feel the need to tell me that. I'm saying all this to say this. Some of the people closest to you can discourage you. But we have to be to be focused on Christ to maintain our compassion. We live in one of the most polarized Americas that has ever existed. And we must be careful as a church because we're all kind of the same ilk. But we have to be careful that we don't build an echo chamber where we start to think that uh, imagine whatever you want, a liberal alternate lifestyle, uh, America-hating person is not welcome in here to come hear the message of God. We can never allow ourselves to go down that path. We've always got to have our eyes on God who loves everyone. We can't forget 1 Timothy 2.4. God desires all men to be saved. Everybody that still has a breath of life, he loves them and he wants them to come home. And it's easy to say it, but it's another thing to go and do it. So we have got to ensure that People that affect us and make us um, less compassionate, have less love, less desire to witness to the lost, we need to be very careful around those individuals, okay? We can't lose our compassion for others. Now let's go into our next stone we're going to pick up, and that's live upon trust. Now I do want to anchor here for a moment because... <clears throat> I want us to understand there, there's a difference between trust and believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I really wish that the translators would have used trust. Because there's a chasm of difference between belief and trust. See, trust is, I know when I stand before God, the only single thing that's going to save me is his blood and his promise. That's it. That is trust. Belief, you may know that that can happen, but you may not be trusting in that to happen. See, that's why it's called amazing grace. Because once you truly understand that there's nothing in this world that anybody can do, and God has given you not only no penalty from sin, but he's given you his a joint hair righteousness, just out of his own blood and promise, it blows your mind. Now, I'm going to circle back to this in a second, but I want to go on to circle. Circle back. Circle back. It's a military term. We're going to circle back. and um, 
So how do we do it? How do you, how do you live upon trust? You depend upon God alone, and you prevent the world's deceptions from swaying you. Now, when I say alone, what I don't mean is that you take a passive stance of, okay, I'm just going to trust. If, if God wants more people in Athel Baptist, I'm just going to trust him, and I'm going to sit here and do nothing about it. I'm just going to trust him. That's not what I'm talking about in, when I use the term alone. What I mean is you trust God for the outcome. The output is still our responsibility. That's why Proverbs 21, 31 is so powerful to me. The horse is prepared for the day of victory, but the horse prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. See, our responsibility is the output. We're the ones that need to go out and witness. We're the ones that need to let people know we're here. We're the ones that need to go out. I can't give you the reason why. I just know that that's how God wants it done. Could God choose to just make everybody believe and just give everybody no choice? Like, yeah, but that's not what he does, and that's not what the Bible says he does. The Bible says what? Great commission. We are the ones to go out. He wants laborers. He expects us to do the work. So we have got to step up and do it. So the alone part is I allow the outcome to rest upon God. That's how you can witness to somebody and not get wrapped around the axle. Because it's not what you're saying. It's not an argument you give. It's the Holy Spirit's job to call him. Your job is simply to bring the message and to be faithful and exemplify a holy life. That is the output that is required from us. You leave the results to God. Now let's turn back to uh, 33. I'm going to go through this. I, I, love, I love this passage here. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock and went after it and struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helm on his head. He clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Now, many people read that, and they think how amazing it was that, that David stood up to a bear, a lion, and a king. But that wasn't the greatest thing that David stood up to. Do you know what the the greatest thing he stood up to in that, that passage is? Temptation. What was the temptation? Did you, did you catch it? The temptation is not to trust in God, but to trust in the king's armor. Don't forget that. Put in the context, you're a shepherd boy who you've done nothing but live in the wilderness your entire life, I mean, figuratively speaking. You have a staff, a sling, You've done wonderful things in your life, and I can only imagine sitting there and seeing like this. I mean, it was the king's armor. It must have been immaculate, and it must have been awe-inspiring. And there was the choice. David, are you going to trust in God who brought you to this moment, who's allowed you to kill? Say, he said it himself. He saved me from the lion. He saved me from the bear when I had nothing. Are you going to trust in God, or are you going to trust in Saul and his armor? Because, see, this is the key. This is the world's deception. Genesis 3.1, has God indeed said? Every false religion is built on the dynamic foundation of has God indeed said? Has God indeed said that he paid the entire penalty for sin? Has God indeed said that gift is a, grace is a gift? Has God indeed said that you shouldn't go to church every single week? that you need attendance 
to come into his glory? Has God indeed said that you don't need sacraments? Has God indeed said that you don't have to go to a particular church? See, that is the power of every false religion is they trick people into believing that that man can build the bridge to God. But the only bridge to God is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father except through me. So we have got to stand on trust alone. It's through grace alone, in faith alone, in Christ alone, as revealed in the Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. It's, it's that simple. And we have got to fight against the world's deceptions. When we went to Community Bible Church back in Beaufort, South Carolina, um, which is run by Dr. Carl Brogy, and that is definitely an exception to the rule of a, of a big church that is definitely a Bible-fearing, Bible-preaching church. And I remember going to the new members meeting, and they had a questionnaire for you, and what the, one of the first questions was, if you died tonight, what is the percent that you would go to heaven? And, uh, you know, the right answer is 100%. But there are many believers who wouldn't put 100% because they still don't understand salvation. You see, it's 100% because it's nothing to do with you. It has every single thing to do with his blood and his promise. So when you, I can't tell you as a pastor when we have counseling, it terrifies me to the core when I ask somebody to explain to me about salvation. I'm not trying to quiz them. I'm not trying to be a jerk or be some doctrinal I'm just trying to understand that they understand salvation. And when someone can't simply in some way say it's about his blood and his promise and that's all. I mean, if I stand for, I mean, literally, I, when I envision it, I'm standing for God and I'm like, if it's not your blood and your promise of me trusting your blood, I, I got nothing. So when you talk with people, even people that sit in this pews for years and they can't explain that, you need to use that as a diagnostic tool to start witnessing to them and mentoring them because it's all about grace. And when you do that, that is a very bold thing to say in these days. So the last, one of the last songs we're going to pick up is boldness. Now, this is something I'm very fond of. Drop Point Ministries is built on boldness. Uh, I've been working on a book for about five years on boldness. I'll get that done at some point. Now, when I say boldness, I don't mean brashness, right? I don't mean abrasiveness. I don't mean unnecessarily just rubbing people. Kind of like this tie. What was this tie? <laughs> and I, it obviously did the trick because I didn't know if it would be that. But, you know, this is bold. This is definitely an orange tie. You either love it or you hate it, right? Thank you, BJ. So as a Christian, when you stand on God's truth and you're bold, you're either going to have people that will flock with you or you're going to have people that oppose you vehemently. There's not going to be a lot of middle ground. And I don't know how you look at the last days, but I tend to think that the Laodicean era is upon us because you look at churches and churches are, are striving to be lukewarm. They're too concerned about attendance numbers. They're too concerned about offending people. We just need to stand on God's word, and where we fall out is where we fall out. So how do we do this? How do we commit to boldness? You stand on God's truth regardless of your probable dejection from society. Because that's reality, right? God said it himself. Will not the servant be treated less than the master? They mocked him. They killed him. Can we expect anything less than that? Now, coming up is one of my absolute one of my favorite passages in the Bible, for sure. Now, I don't know about you. I'm a bit of a dreamer. You know, uh, uh, I like to make fun of myself, too. When I was a young boy, I was Michael Jordan I thought was the coolest dude. And um, I thought I was going to be good at basketball. I even started calling myself Air Alderson. And, you know, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah, I know. My sister still mocks me for it. And when you grow up in a small town like Columbia in Alabama, you can have these kind of visions. So you actually like go out and play basketball, and you're like, oh, wow, I got no chance. So I, so I, left, that, I left that dream fairly early on. I think I was in my teenage years when I finally realized that I wasn't going to go to the NBA. Um, and all throughout my life, you know, I, I thought I was going to be a, 
a fighter ace. Like I've I've done a lot of crazy stuff. I thought I was going to be a professional bronc rider, and that lasted two rides. Um, bull, bull riding was about two rides too. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I tend to swing for the fences. It's just kind of my personality, and that's why a lot of these, some movies are so inspiring and. You know, I think of three just offhand, like Braveheart, right? One of my favorite movies. Like, what's the best part of Braveheart, right? I am William Wallace, right? You know? Uh, Gladiator, right? My name is Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered child, husband to a murdered wife. Um, you know, and Princess Bride, for those of you a little bit more G-rated, like, my name is Diego Montoya, I'm killed a six-fingered man. Um, <laughs> I know y'all love my southern imitations of other accents. It's wonderful. <laughs> but all of those pale in comparison to what Dave is about to do. Join me, if you will, in uh, I believe it's going to be 41. Yes, 41. So the Philistine came. And began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about him and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you would come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I just, this, I love this moment. I mean, I mean, can, can you? Imagine this moment. You are a shepherd boy, a young man, right? You're dressed in a tunic with a sling on a battlefield in front of grown men in armor who have been terrified for 40 days to face this dude who's likely nine foot tall. And I don't remember all the numbers for the massiveness of his shield, his sword, his javelin, etc. But it's ridiculous. In front of this huge army that everybody's terrifying. And you're about to say this. This is amazing. I love this part. <clears throat> then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, all offensive weapons. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, this day right now, the Lord will deliver you to in my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all this earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. I want to inspire you with this message. Every one of you have a moment like this. It may not be on a national stage. It may not be on an international stage. But I can tell you from a person who's been Christian and unabashedly Christian for the last decade, that it is impossible to live a life and not have moments like this. On the same hand, though, you've got to train for it because when God opens that door, if you've trained and you've prepared, you will get after it like a bear lion. But you're wrong in your thinking. If you've been timid, you haven't been in his word, you haven't been prepared when that door opens, that you're going to run through it. You know, in military and law enforcement, we say you don't rise to your highest potential, you fall to your lowest training. So if you're not in the Word, if you're not living a holy life, when that door opens, you're not going to magically get, you know, the Holy Spirit's already within us. He's not just going to take over your body and you're going to go over there and do some amazing things and black out and be like, I just have no idea what happened. Was it amazing? That's not what happens. <clears throat> But if you want that moment, you've got to get ready for it. And when the door opens, we've all had moments in those life. I know I'm a, I'm a pretty good procrastinator. It's one of my best skills, procrastination. And there's been times doors have opened, and I've been like, man, I wish I had another week for this door to open, but it didn't. It's there, so just go for it. Um, we've got to be ready for those doors. We've got to get ready. Those moments are there for us. And don't think you're not going to be terrified in those moments. Don't think that for that door to open that it's not about fear. The have no fear is no fear of man. I mean, think about Christ himself. When he was preparing the disciples for his, his uh, death, he said, Now is my soul troubled. Father, save me from this hour. 
Christ himself, God himself, asked to be saved from the work he was about to do. In fact, he agonized it over so much, he bled in the Garden of Gethsemane. But, but how did he respond? He said, not my will, Father, but your own. Glorify your name. So don't think you won't be terrified in those moments. Don't think you might, you might not win. But your job is to stand up and say, you know what? This is my name. This is who I'm for. Glorify God. Let's bring it. That's all you can be asked to do. And get back up and do it again. Those moments are there for us. We've just got to get after them. And that is why this is so important. Because now when you come together, you can share the funny stories. Like, yeah, I was in Roger's Burger, and I like, I went off. I told him I was Richard Olson or Christian. They all need, you know, and you're like, Man, you lost your mind. Like, it's funny. We can laugh about it. We're here to encourage. We're here to exhort. We're here to build each other up. Church is about us coming together, giving each other spiritual talents. This is us coming together so we can go out and fight the world. We need to do that by investing in each other and being committed to this church. If Athel Baptist isn't your flavor, it's okay. We're not offended by that. But you need to commit to some church and commit to it for your life unless there's something that God pulls you away from it or they go down a path of heresy. But other than that, it's like a bride. You commit to that church, you stick with it through thick and thin, and you make it work. Now let's get to our last stone in my last few minutes here. Step up in faith. That was what the, all the last sermon was about. Uh, I'm not going to hash a lot of that, but my goal of today was hopefully to inspire you to step up in faith. But more importantly, I don't want you to misunderstand what this sermon series is about. Circle back now. <laughs> to our first point, which is, Again, I can't define for you what a distraction is. I can't define for you what is recreation. I can't define for you what is infatuation. Just like I cannot define for you what your mission from God is to do. We all have something to do in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, reread that if you don't believe me. We all have something we need to be doing for the body of Christ, specifically for the body of believers that you have committed to be a part of. Anything that is causing you to deviate from that path, you need to look at getting rid of that. If you can spend all day watching football on a Saturday, and I'm arbitrary numbers, and still do your mission, it is what it is. That, that is for you to decide and you to answer for. But whatever your mission is in God's kingdom, one, you need to figure it out, and one, you need to get after it. That is what I'm hoping to inspire all of us to do. It's not all, we're not all called to be pastors. If we were all called to be pastors, this would, this would be a boring because no one would be listening, right? We need all these people, hospitality, nursery workers, a council person, right? We need a council person. You know, we need all these people to make it work. And Christ, when Christ says, take up your cross, that is not an encouraging commandment. The cross was getting nailed through this little sensitive part of your hand and then dying an agonized death of asphyxiation as you hit brutal, and they were saving on nails, so they drilled your two feet together in the bottom, right? So when he says take up your cross, he's not encouraging you to, like, name it and claim it, you know? He's telling you to be willing to deal with boredom, unappreciation, Frustration, hypocriticalness. He's asking us to do all the things that need to be done so his kingdom can operate. We own a church constitution. If we don't have councilmen, we can't do church business. And if business is an aspect. We don't live in a utopia. We have to do stuff like pay for lights, pay for sound. Have all, we, we have to do this stuff. So if you have the capability, the door is open. Somebody needs to step through that door. Ooh, look at that. Bam. That's pretty good. I just get this thing to stop. There we go. All right. All right, so now as the man comes up, uh, I just want to end with this application. And again, this is our family verse, you know. Um, 
We didn't vote on it. I just picked it. (laughs) (laughs) But I love it because, again, I think everything about life is a battle. That's just how I'm hardwired. But it reminds me all the time that we have our part to play. Everybody has a part to play in your own life, in this church, in God's kingdom. If you take nothing else from these past two sermons, I just hope that you'll be willing to step up in the area that God is calling you to step up. And if you don't feel this calling, step up in a door that's open because that is where he needs somebody. He needs a Christian to fill the gap. Because that's the one thing you look at all the history of the militaries and the battles. There were some poor units that if they didn't fill that gap, that battle wasn't going to be won. And it didn't go well for that unit. And I can tell you nursery working and councilmen are not the most exciting and not the most gratifying thing you can do for this church. But it is one of the most needed. If we can't get nursery workers, we can't get young people, we can't get children in here, and we're going to die a slow death. We need people stepping up. It's just, it is what it is. All right, let's go to the word. Go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for this church. Lord, just thank you for um, this church. And I, I know I've spent a sermon beating up on people, but I just want to mention what an amazing church because as I look out, I've seen so many faces that have done so much in hospitality and videos and cleaning. And we are truly a church of volunteers, of people that have been willing to give so much of their time and sacrifice. And Lord, I I pray that you can provide thanks for them that we can't because we sometimes get caught up in our own lives that we fail to appreciate the works of others. And I know I have to confess as pastoral staff, that is one of my failings. And I need to take lessons from Pastor Greg Moore of, of ensuring that I share my appreciation and my gratitude for those who make all of this possible. Lord, I just thank you for the sermon series. I thank you for church is willing to allow me to get up here and and uh, speak too fast and uh, use strange phrases that don't make any sense. Lord, I just pray that the message was received and people will step up and I pray that you bless the future apologetics class. I thank you for these beautiful women that put up with men. And I pray that you strengthen these men for the battles that lay ahead. So thankful that we live in a country where we still praise your name. And may we appreciate every moment. May we hear every note. And may we appreciate the calm before the storm. All these things are in Jesus Christ's loving name. Amen.